I recently read David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell. In the timeless story of David and Goliath, a shepherd boy with a wooden staff and a sling volunteers to fight a seven-foot giant to the death. The giant is a heavily armored warrior carrying a sword and spear. When he sees David with his wooden staff, he laughs and says, Am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? But then David stops, quietly puts a stone in his sling, and fires it at a tiny opening in Goliath's helmet. Goliath falls to the ground, stunned. David runs to Goliath, grabs his sword, and cuts his head off. David is victorious. It's a miracle. Or is it? David may have seemed like a huge underdog who got lucky, but nothing could be further from the truth. As you'll find out in this video and in Gladwell's book, underdogs like David pull off surprising victories much more often than you think. The key to pulling off surprising victories against powerful foes is to strategically neutralize their advantage. Goliath was big, strong, and powerful, but that didn't matter because David was not going to engage Goliath in sword-to-sword -sword combat, like most ritualistic single combat battles had been settled. David planned to fight Goliath from a distance and turn the battle into a contest between Goliath's spear-throwing abilities and his sling-shooting skills. When telling the David and Goliath story, most people happen to leave with the fact that David was a sling master who killed bears and lions that tried to run off with a sheep. And although David's sling may have looked harmless, historians estimate that it could hurl stones with a stopping power equivalent to the modern handgun. By going against conventional wisdom and strategically altering the rules of engagement, David neutralized Goliath's size, strength, and power and flipped the odds in his favor. A few years ago, an 8th grade girls basketball team from Redwood City, California adopted a similar strategy and made it all the way to the national championship game. At the beginning of the season, only two Redwood City girls had played basketball before, and none of the girls could shoot well, but that didn't matter. The Redwood City girls planned to hide their weaknesses by getting really good at just two overlooked aspects of a basketball game, defending the inbounds pass and full court pressing. The rules of basketball state that you only have five seconds to inbound a ball and 10 seconds to get the ball past half court. So if Redwood City could prevent their opponents from inbounding the ball on time, or getting the ball across half court in time, they could force their opponents to turn over the ball before they had a chance to utilize their superior shooting and passing skills. Redwood City dedicated their practices to mastering the full court press and being the fitter, faster team. It paid off. At the start of most games, the Redwood City girls would often go up 10-0 or 20-0 against more experienced teams because the full court press typically led to steals under their opponent's net for an easy layup. The coaches and parents of the teams they faced criticized Redwood City's coach for playing the game wrong. One parent even challenged the coach to a fight in the parking lot after a game. When you compete in an unconventional way, you will get laughed at like David or criticized like the Redwood City coach. But as the saying goes, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. The next time you face a powerful opponent, ask yourself, how can I fight this battle on my terms and neutralize my opponent's advantage? If you're facing a giant business competitor, center your marketing campaign around character and quality instead of efficiency and cost. You want to be like a small coffee shop that competes against large coffee chains like Starbucks by promoting the fact that they use coffee beans from a small family farm in Honduras and roast their beans on site at the coffee shop for maximum freshness, a tactic that just isn't feasible for a massive coffee shop chain like Starbucks. Fighting a battle on your terms may require a deep understanding of the rules and a willingness to bend the rules. Author and podcaster Tim Ferriss entered a Chinese national kickboxing tournament and won gold by studying the rules of competition and learning that if he pushed his opponent off the elevated platform three times in a single round, he would automatically win the match. So Ferriss leveraged his high school wrestling training and made every match a pushing contest instead of a kickboxing contest. So let's say you're up against a giant and you have a plan to neutralize their advantage. You still need a tremendous amount of skill and confidence to pull off a victory. Paradoxically, underdogs acquire the skill and confidence needed to take down giants by spending most of their time feeling like a giant. If you were a promising young economic student, where would you go to graduate school? A great school like Harvard or a merely good school like the University of Toronto? If you're good enough to get into Harvard, 
but choose to go to the University of Toronto and graduate in the top 5% of your class, you are twice as likely to get a paper published in a prestigious economic journal than 80% of Harvard graduates. Harvard economists, who graduate in the top 5% of their class, publish 2.4 papers in the six years after they graduate. University of Toronto economists, who graduate in the top 5% of their class, publish an average of 1.8 papers in the six years after they graduate. But Harvard economists, who fail to graduate in the top 20% of their class, publish just 0.7 papers in the six years after graduation. You must be exceptionally smart and hardworking to get into a PhD program at Harvard, but once admitted, you risk feeling average. After a year or two at Harvard, you might realize that your peers are better economists than you, and your willingness to pursue an audacious goal in your field, like getting your work published in a prestigious journal, wanes. In other words, the more time you spend feeling like a small fish in a big pond, the less likely you are to step up when faced with an enormous obstacle or opportunity. David didn't hone his skills in the army alongside thousands of men that would have made him feel average. David mastered the sling in the countryside against wild animals and consistently came out on top. When he eventually found himself on the battlefield, he was the only soldier among thousands confident enough to take on Goliath. Whatever you're doing, aim to be a big fish in a small pond. Compete in environments where you feel challenged, but know you're one of the best. Recent research says that the win rate for optimal learning is 85%. If you can find an environment where you feel like you're winning 85% of the time, you will steadily develop the skill and confidence to take on giants. In the end, prepare to battle giants by routinely being a big fish in a small pond. Then, when you encounter a heavily favored rival, neutralize your opponent's advantage by fighting in an unconventional way and shifting the competition away from their strengths and toward an aspect of the game where you have the upper hand. As the playwright George Bernard Shaw once said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. That was the core message that I gathered from David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell. This was an extremely enjoyable read that got me to think differently about facing seemingly insurmountable obstacles. I highly recommend it. If you would like a one-page PDF summary of insights that I gather from this book, just click the link below and I'll be happy to email it to you. If you already subscribed to the free Productivity Game email newsletter, this PDF is sitting in your inbox. If you like this video, please share it. And as always, thanks for watching and have yourself a productive week.